Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Equity Crowdfunding and the Future of Raising Money, presented by Indiegogo Micro Ventures and Early Growth Financial Services. My name is Jason Kennedy. I'll be your moderator today from the EGFS team. Uh, just a few quick notes before we jump into it. This webinar is going to last approximately 60 minutes, and that includes some time for Q&A uh, baked in at the end of the presentation. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be sent to all registrants within 48 hours of the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, you can also find this recording and all previous webinar recordings on our YouTube channel, Early Growth. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll jump right in and introduce our three uh, fantastic panelists for today, uh, starting with Michael Hughes, Senior Director, Equity Crowdfunding over at Indiegogo. Michael, take a moment and say hello to the crowd. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, so I'm heading up the new equity crowdfunding division, if you will, over at Indiegogo. Um, Indiegogo, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with, we, we invented crowdfunding back in 2008, and we've always been bullish on what's now called equity crowdfunding. So still new for us, we'll get into that in a second, but excited to be here. Great, thank you, Michael. Next up, we've got Bill Clark, CEO of Micro Ventures and COO of First Democracy VC. Bill, say hello. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I am the CEO of Micro Ventures, but um, I guess the First Democracy VC just wanted to give you guys a little background on that. That is our funding portal partnership with Indiegogo, and so we started that a little over six months ago. On the microventure side, we've been raising money for startups for almost seven years, and uh, it's been mainly with accredited investors, and we've raised a little over $100 million. And as Michael said, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the equity and the regulation CF side in a little bit, but glad to have you all join and look forward to answering any questions. Great, thanks, Bill. And finally, uh, for my team here at EGFS, Gadiel Morantes, President and Partner, Early Growth Financial Services. Gadiel, welcome aboard. Thanks, Jason. So, and thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, just really quick on early growth. Um, we work with a lot of early stage companies. Um, many of them are technology companies and small to medium sized businesses. We offer tax preparation services, 409A valuations, and all the day-to-day -day transactional accounting and CFO consulting services for many companies throughout the U.S. Uh, headquartered in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, but have a presence in New York, Chicago, Seattle, and the LA markets as well. And equity crowdfunding for us, I mean, we've seen a lot of activity here recently, and so it's something that uh, we've been paying a lot more attention to and focusing on working with folks um, to help them through that process. And so I'm really looking forward to this webinar. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from uh, Michael and Bill, frankly, on, on the whole process. Back to you, Jason. Great, thank you gentlemen for joining us today. Uh, and, and we'll jump right in starting uh, with Michael and talking about why we're talking about equity crowdfunding. So Michael, what, where, where do we start here? Sure, uh, thanks Jason. So. I mean, I think we can take this a number of different ways, but really, I would say at a high level, um, Gadiel kind of mentioned it, but you know, equity crowdfunding is all of a sudden this very popular buzzword, um, sort of trendy, Very everyone's talking about it, but I think there's still a lot of confusion, um, the sort of a lack of education on both the investor and the entrepreneur side. Um, and then I'd also mention that, I mean, the reason that, you know, Obviously, I said that Indiegogo, we've been doing crowdfunding since 2008, but the reason that equity crowdfunding is now such a hot item is, particularly here in the U.S., is what we're focused on, is that the law has finally changed um, like just a year ago. I'm going to let Bill, we'll get into a little bit more of the detail there later on in the presentation, but you know, it's timely, one, because all of a sudden it's now allowed, and really the high level or just real quickly, is that anyone can now invest in startups and early stage companies. Um, you know, Bill mentioned they've been doing accredited investor, which is another way of saying wealthy people, which is a very small percentage of the US population. Um, 
that's been going very well. But now all of a sudden, a massive group of people in the US um, can invest. So it's really a game changer. But I think there's still a lot of education that needs to happen. So we're excited to kind of go into as much as we can and, and answer questions. So here we are. Nice. So uh, let's jump into some overall statistics about what we're looking at in the market right now. Sure. So as you can see here in the slide, I mean, a lot of what we're focused on, and, and again, Bill will kind of get into the, the differences in a second here, but I mentioned that, you know, a lot of you have probably heard of the Jobs Act under Obama that passed in 2012, and there's various titles of the Jobs Act. And without getting into too much detail, the one that we were really waiting for was Title III. Um, it took a lot longer than expected to pass, as things often do in government, but finally did pass and became official in May of 2016. So just over a year ago, just had the year anniversary. And to, to us, that was the real launch of you know, the true equity crowdfunding, the true democratization of fundraising where anyone at all can now invest. It's you know not just for high growth tech startups or really any business. So kind of a win-win for everyone, but still very new. So you know when it, these stats are specifically about what's Title III of the Jobs Act, also known as Reg CF or Regulation Crowdfunding. When we say either of those things, we, it's the same thing. Um, there are other types of equity crowdfunding that Bill will touch on just very briefly, but that this is our focus. Um, but yeah, to date, and we're talking only a year here, the year for the industry, but you know, Indiegogo and MicroVentures, as Bill mentioned, our, our platform, First Democracy VC, we've only been doing it for just over six months. So it's brand, brand new for everyone but off to a great start, you know, over $40, $40 million has already been committed to these Title III equity crowdfunding raises. A um, little over 40% have been funded, um, which is a good sign. And then, you know, 360, and this is as of, you know, like a week ago, so I know it's more than that already, growing weekly, companies have already launched one of these offerings to raise money. Um, you can see the kind of distribution around the country, Know, kind of the obvious Massachusetts, Texas, California, but you know, people are investing from all over the US and actually all over uh, the world. So the companies have to be, for this particular race, have to be incorporated in the US, but investors can come from anywhere in the world, which is really interesting. And then finally, I mean, the, the kind of distribution of types of raises, I mean, a lot of people think of tech startups, and it's, it's definitely for tech startups. But it's not only for tech startups, and we're still learning. But we've we've seen some really interesting things in a variety of verticals, like breweries and distilleries and restaurants and media companies, and you know, you name it, people are doing it. So it's not only hardware, software. We've done a film. Um, it's not limited to just tech, which is really really fascinating. And um, a lot of these industries are, are taking this new path. Okay, great. So let's take a look uh, at the last uh, six months of equity crowdfunding, kind of breaking it down um, uh, just a little bit further. Is there anything that anything in particular you want to highlight here? Yeah, and this these statistics, like I said, this is specific to First Democracy VC, which Bill mentioned is the joint venture between um, Indiegogo and MicroVentures to do these Title Three Reg CF raises. So this is just our particular numbers. Um, one thing just to highlight here. You know, you can see it's early, but you can see the variety of verticals that I mentioned, but we're really proud of this. I mean, we're still learning and growing, but we've actually to date launched 13 company, 13 raises, um, 12 of them have closed. And out of those 12, all 12 have been funded. So you know, we're batting a thousand. And when I say funded, I mean, they've hit at least their minimum fundraising goal. So each company has a minimum goal and a maximum goal. Um, every single one that we've done has hit at least their minimum goal, and three out of those 12, so 25%, have actually been um, oversubscribed, which is really, really cool. So, you know, people are investing different types of companies, and, you know, there's other people doing it, but for First Democracy VC, our, our focus is really on um, a variety of different companies and industries, but, you know, we are, we're looking to be, help people be successful. So we're pretty proud of that, but it's been it's been great for six months, but we're still learning every day. 
Great, great. So uh, kind of kicking it over, uh, just a little bit more information here, breakdown kind of worldwide. Uh, can you talk us through kind of types of offerings we've got here? Yeah, and you, you can see the countries. I mean, again, investments are coming from everywhere. So some of the obvious countries, I think, here. But you know, we have seen, even for local um, raises, by, by the way, which I'll get into in one example later. But you know, we've been surprised that people really are investing from all over the world, as long as it's a good investment. So it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, the thing to highlight here is that it, it's called equity crowdfunding. That's sort of just the term that I guess people grabbed onto. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be an, an equity raise, right? So a lot of people, it's kind of a misnomer in that sense where, again, these are stats just from our particular offerings. So out of the um, deals that we've launched so far, you can see the kind of breakdown is pretty evenly split where there are traditional equity deals, but there's also convertible note deals. And then a lot of these are actually revenue share deals, which I think a lot of people aren't aware of. It doesn't necessarily, and it, it's going to depend on your business and your industry, et cetera. But again, we'll get into an example, but for you know, a lot of these restaurants or distilleries and breweries have sort of gone the revenue share route to you know, reward their investors. And it's been quite, quite interesting to see. Uh, an interesting note there in the top investor countries is uh, Switzerland listed there at number two. Is uh, do you have any data as to why that's the case? Is it uh, something like the stereotypical Swiss bank type of setup, or is there just like a lot of investor interest that's based in Switzerland? Yeah, I don't. I don't want to try to guess, but I think you're probably right. It's probably a lot of the the things you mentioned, but you know, um, I, don't, I I think these these countries are. Didn't surprise us completely, but we have, again, like seen all over the U.S., every state, and then lots of different countries. These are just kind of the first top five out of the gate for our particular platform. But I don't know, Switzerland, maybe everyone's concentrated over there. And yeah, a lot of Swiss banks, so a lot of money flowing in Switzerland, which is good. Nice, nice. Okay, thanks, Michael. So, uh, Bill, let's talk a little bit about using crowdfunding uh, as an entrepreneur. Like where, where should they start? What should they be thinking about? Yeah, thanks. So I think, you know, to start off, you know, talking a little bit about the history of equity crowdfunding or just online investing um, and a little bit about what microventures did in the past. If you wanted to raise money a little over a year ago, one of the only ways that you could do it online was through Regulation D, typically 506, which um, is basically only allowing accredited investors to participate. And there were a lot of restrictions with that. So you couldn't solicit uh, your deal. If you did solicit your deal, there were additional restrictions where you would have to prove that somebody was accredited investor instead of just checking a box. And so that would that could mean providing tax documents, bank statements. Just there were a lot of hoops to go through. So it wasn't it wasn't something that a lot of people did. Uh, you know, fast forward to um, a, a little over a year ago. Title III came in and also called Reg Regulation CF, which allows anyone to invest. And, and I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the benefits of that. One is that you can raise up to a million dollars. You actually can raise $1,070,000, which is the, um, the, the SEC increased it by 7% due to inflation after the first year, which was nice. So we expect that that will increase over time. There are some things that you do need to consider if you're using Title III. First, if you raise over $100,000, you will need to get a fin financial review done of your books for the previous two years. Um, and if you, if you raise over $500,000, you have to get a financial audit. Now, one thing that the SEC did was they said that for a first time raiser, all you have to do is get a financial review. So that's nice. So it's a little bit less burdensome. Um, and so those are just some things to consider. But the, the positive side is, is that, like Michael said, anyone can invest. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but um, you, you can do general solicitation and you can get that out there through social media in various channels. So it's a good way to raise a million dollars. And especially from if you have a network and, and um, you, know, you can get it out to your audience. Another one, and we'll just talk about it briefly because we're not really getting into it in too much detail, is Regulation A. And Reg A 
that's been around a little bit longer than a year. It's been, uh, it's actually been around for a while, but it was um, updated a few years ago to, to make it a little bit easier to raise. Um, the downside to that is it can take up to four to maybe five months to raise money or to, to be ready to raise money. Uh, there's a lot of SEC hoops that you have to go through, and it costs about fifty to hundred thousand dollars to get one of those offerings completed. One of the nice things about it, though, is that you can raise up to fifty million dollars. So, uh, it's if if you want to go, if you have the appetite, and you think that your audience has the appetite, and you want to wait, that's that's another alternative there. It's just it just takes a little bit longer. So. You know, those are those are some of the the ways that a company can look at to to decide. You know, what's right for them to to raise capital. Okay, wanna, great. And sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just to say, you want to jump to the next slide? Yeah, absolutely. Talk about how anybody can be an investor, right? Yeah. So I think that we've talked a little bit about this, and it is. It's easy to say anyone can be, be an investor, but there are some things that you need to be aware of. And the first is you need to be 18 years of age or older. Um, that's just an SEC requirement. And then if you're in the U.S., then anyone can invest as long as you're 18 or older. If you're outside of the U.S., you can invest, but you just need to check with your local security laws and just make sure that there's no restrictions or no issues with investing, um, but uh, we haven't really run into any of those yet, um, so um, it, it's, it is pretty open. The other thing that you do need to consider, and this, this helps, you know, as a, uh, as a company, you know, you want to set minimums and maximum or, or a minimum amount that, you, that you'll accept as an investment. Um, on our platform, we do a $100 minimum, but there are limits to how much an investor can invest in a 12 month period. So anyone can invest $2,000 in 12 month period. And then there are different rules around investing that can get you up to a hundred thousand dollars. So that is based off of your income and your net worth. And so it's a little bit confusing, but the easiest way to look at it is, if either your income or your net worth are below $100,000, then you can invest 5% of the lower amount. So, um, so, so that, that's one level. And then if, you're, if both of your income and net worth are over $100,000, then you can invest 10% of the lower. So if you make a million dollars a year and you have a net worth of a million dollars a year, you can then invest $100,000. So, it's just one thing to think about. And if you're a company, you want to make sure that you're not setting the bar too high so that you don't have somebody making one investment of $2,000, let's say, and then they can't invest in anything else because the spirit of equity crowdfunding is giving people the ability to invest in lots of investments and spread out the diversification. So if, if they can only invest in one, then they would probably move on, move on and look, look at other offerings. So... So yeah, that's that's a little bit about um, you know who can invest. Nice. Okay. Thanks, Bill. So, Michael, you talked a little bit about an example earlier that you had. Uh, we're looking at it here with Republic Restoratives. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background there? Sure. So yeah, this one's near and dear to my heart. The, these guys are actually uh, so it's two women. It's the first ever. Women, woman founded distillery in Washington, D.C. Um, and what's cool is they actually started out on Indiegogo, Copper, I love to call it. So our, our regular crowdfunding site where they did a what's called a perks rewards based crowdfunding campaign. Um, you'll see on Indiegogo, Kickstarter, etc. So they, they raised a hundred over hundred thousand dollars from the crowd. You know, those are people money not actually investing they were just giving money to maybe get an invite to a party or get some sort of reward that's how they got this is the ground a few years ago. so they got that money you know hundred thousand dollars of course didn't cover all of it etc got the business started one they had you know uh about six 
months traction still can correct me later but I'm still early in their business but things are going very very well hey hey michael just to hey. just to jump in real quick you're, you're breaking up a little bit um i don't know if you, uh, you move okay. spots but you're breaking up a little bit there dude um all right let me know if i continue to recap. um so Republic Restorative, so yeah, so they came back to us for an equity crowdfund raise, and they were one of the first four companies that we launched with um, when we launched our November. And long story short, they were able to, their maximum goal was $300,000. So they actually didn't want to raise more than $300,000. They ended up raising the whole $300,000 from 600 plus people. Um, and there the deal was oversubscribed. So it was very, very popular. A couple of quick things to note. Um, that was a revenue share deal. The details, but it was a revenue share. Um, and the other cool thing, and we kind of touched on this earlier, but you know, this is a local distillery in Washington, DC. We just kind of assumed only people in that geographical area would invest. But we were really pleasantly surprised to see that people from all over the country and really even all over the world actually in this deal. So that was a really encouraging sign for us to say that, you know, like I said before, I can't speak for any particular investor, but it seems that, you know, people are, are actually just looking for good investments um, regardless of location. So that was really positive. So again, they were able to go to their community and we helped promote it, et cetera. And, you know, another three hundred thousand dollars in the bank for them from people to continue making great drinks in DC. Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, great example there. Uh, kind of jumping over. Uh, so, equity crowdfunding. Uh, Bill, I'll start with you. I mean. Bill, is it right for you? Is it right for the listeners here? What what should they be looking at? What what should be, what should they be considering uh, if they're looking to get into the crowdfunding equity crowdfunding game? Yeah. So the so why don't you jump to the next slide and we can uh, I think we have a list of of some of the things to consider. The first we'll kind of go over the uh, from an issuer or an entrepreneur. Is it is it right for you? And I'm not going to go through each one of these. This is a checklist that you should look at and say, uh, you know, if do you think your company um, is a good fit? Th these are some of the things that you need to consider. But I'm going to talk ab about a few of them. So the first thing is raising money online is a lot different than raising money from a face to face conversation. You have the ability to put together a campaign page, which we help you with. And we actually do a lot of the work. And then you get to put, put together a video and then you have a, the ability to answer questions in a discussion board. But other than that, you're not talking face to face with somebody. You're not, you, you don't have the ability to talk to them for 30 minutes. They can learn about you and get comfortable with you. Um, and let's be honest, a lot of times you're investing in a team or, or, or one person that you think can take it to the next level and has a great idea. So you have to put together a, a a page and a compelling story that will get people intrigued and want to learn more and want to invest. So it has to be something that is easy for investors to understand and that they can relate to. So that's one of the things that will um, take you to like the next level as far as ra raising money. Another thing that we look for is traction and traction can be many different things. It and, it and it just varies from company to company. So it's hard to just put it on one thing, but it could be if you're post revenue company, it could be revenue growth consistent month over month for let's just say three to six months or longer, depending on how long you've been in business. If you're in a beta, it could, it could mean you have partnerships and you have um, some, and those partnerships could lead to future business and it's a proof point. So it's a way for investors to say, okay, there's a partnership with X company. I know that company, they've probably done their due diligence on it and it's, and it's, um, and, and it could be a, a good opportunity. And so, um, and then another, another traction point could be just growth of users. So if you're pre-revenue and, and your goal is to get a certain amount of users, 
is that growing consistently month over month? What is the, um, you know, the, how, how often are they using your product or, or if it's an app, your app. So those are, those are types of things. Um, and then one last thing I'll, that I'll just touch on um, before we move over to the investor checklist is have you put together something compelling for an investor where they can understand how they make money? So Michael talked a little bit about Republic Restoratives and the RevShare deal. That was a perfect deal for them because it was an Re Republic Restoratives is an early company um, that that you know on the on the revenue side it was growing and there was a there was a way for investors to participate in that growth and get paid back and what we figure is probably going to be three to four years uh, but they will start to see payments back in one quarter so three months after their investment they can see you know and some of their investment coming back to them or it could be equity or it could be debt or a loan but if you can explain it and it's easy to understand then somebody's going because equity crowdfunding is new to investors and this is an educational time for them and trying to, to teach teach as well as uh, get them to invest so um, so those are so three of the items that we look for all right so let's flip it over to the investor checklist okay yeah so on the investor checklist there's you know again six things similar to what was on the entrepreneur checklist but different things that um, from an investor side what they're looking for i'm not going to touch on financials because gadiel is going to probably talk a little bit about that um but you know that is one one of the things i think that when when an investor comes um, to our site or or to any site and is looking you know one of the things that they they want to understand is what is this money going to be used for and it's easy to just say growth or it's easy to just point it to one thing or 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 um you know just employees and and uh, new hires but if you can be specific about it and say why you're going to use the money and if you raise a hundred thousand we're going to do this this and this and if we raise 500 we're going to do a couple of new things and if we raise a million we're going to open up a new location however it is then that becomes more personal for the investor. And it's like, oh, these are the goals and I want to help them hit their goals. And so, um, you know, it, investors are always kind of looking at that. Another piece is valuation. What is the valuation if you're doing equity or if you're doing a convertible note? And so a lot of times we'll help the entrepreneurs with that. We don't price things, but we will uh, give guidance based on, you know, we've invested in over 200 companies we can compare we can look out what what else is out in the market and we can look at that to say we think that investors will think that this is a fair opportunity because they they hammer on the valuation um and then the other piece and we already talked about so i'm not going to get into a lot but it's, it is the traction in, in the growth and investors are going to like that's one thing that you want to include in your story because investors are looking for that they want to understand it and it it, it um it de-risks an investment if there is some some sort of traction. So, so yeah, there's a lot to think about, and those are just a few of them. Great, great. Thank you very much, Bill. So, before we get uh, into the financial specifically, I just wanted to kind of go around the horn with you guys and see what the future holds. It's still kind of a nascent time, uh, and you know, pe people are starting to kind of look at this as like a serious option. Michael, I'll start with you. Kind of what, you know, looking out over the next couple of years, what what does crowdfunding look like in the early stage ecosystem? Sorry, trying to improve my audio, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, personally, what I think, I mean, just very simply, is that this is a no-brainer, you know, this is going to be the, the future of fundraising. I mean, if you look at statistics, again, just I'm also here in, in Silicon Valley, but if you look at tech startups, which is kind of gets all the the press, if you will, and everyone is always talking about venture capitalists and angel investors, but the vast majority of even tech companies are not a good fit for venture capital um, or maybe even angel investors. So I think there's just a massive need for this and companies of all shapes and sizes across a variety of verticals i mean like i said 
we've done film, we've done video games, we've done it all. And I think, I think this is going to be the new way that entrepreneurs, you know, it's not going to replace every other type of fundraising, in my opinion. I could be wrong, but I think it's a great way to augment a fundraise. So I always look at this as a piece of a fundraise, and I think you're going to see more and more of it from a variety of companies going forward. And, and slowly but surely, investors are going to warm up to it, and this will just be normal in a few years. Great. All right, Bill. Same question to you. Where where do you see this? Uh, how do you see this going down the road here in the next few years? Yeah. When I when I started MicroVentures, the first year and a half were difficult uh, from a educational standpoint for investors, and then also from the company side, it was it was hard to for them to wrap their head around allowing me to to raise money online for them, even though it was in a private setting. It got easier and easier as the years went on and as we had examples that we could point to where companies got uh, received additional funding or were successful after the fact. And so that's where we are at right now in, in the U.S. And you can look over at some of our competitors over in England and that have been doing this or just Europe in general that have been doing this for four or five years and their growth is significant over the last three years. And so I think that, you know, to, to add to what Michael said, over, over the next year, the whole industry is going to have to really educate investors and entrepreneurs. Um, we're not, it's a, it's a lot easier to get the companies to, um, to raise money. Um, it's, it's just the audience is still small, bigger than the accredited side but it's small because they don't understand or they don't even know about it yet. And so we're constantly educating, which is why we're doing webinars like this, trying to get the word out. But I, I, I agree that with Michael that, you know, over the next few years, like this is, this is going to be the way that a lot of companies raise money. And I think that you're going to see a lot of the, the life cycle of a company and a fundraise is going to be going on Indiegogo and doing a perk space campaign first for proof. Then once they ship a product or one, once they fulfill you know, their obligation, then they stay on Indiegogo MicroVentures on First Democracy v, VC or another platform and raise money through, raise a million dollars you know, from investors and test that out. And then as they grow and they get to that next level, then you have Reg A and you could raise $5 million, $10 million, you know, $50 million even. So, um, you know, I think that we'll start to see a lot more of that acceptance into that and more um, over the next few years. Great. Uh, and Gadiel, you have a, a kind of a, a different angle on this as, you know, you're, you're speaking with early stage companies all the time, uh, of course, accounting and finance needs, but you're talking to them a lot about the traditional fundraising process, the VCs and, and that route. What do you think, how do you think equity crowdfunding kind of plays plays into this overall picture kind of down the road? Yeah, I, I, I think there, there's a couple of things, and I think you know Michael and, and Bill articulated them pretty well. Um, the the tr you know quote unquote traditional technology companies, they're not all you know. Many of them are built for VC, and and there's you know the majority of just companies that are out there are not built for VC funding and financing. I think this really opens the doors to those other businesses that are very solid, just not venture backable businesses that are going to make money, they're going to grow, they're going to scale. I think what Bill um, highlighted regarding jumping on an Indiegogo campaign at the early stages with the rewards and shipping products and things like that, that's a fantastic entry point. And using the, the crowdfunding uh, platform to to really accelerate that growth after you've realized some traction is gonna be a huge way to go, um, especially at those early stages as well. And you know, when you think about the examples of like a brewery or uh, a sports drink or something like that, those don't tend to be fundable businesses by VC standards. Their growth, they can have tremendous growth, but their growth tends to be a little bit slower um, and, and, you know, the ref share piece of it, I, I actually hadn't heard about uh, doing ref share deals on the crowdfunding yet. I think those are really interesting and, and could be potentially, uh, you know, really opening the doors for these potential investors moving forward. So 
it's still it's still a little bit of the wild west and i think that there's a lot to learn still and i think the government is still um you know it's kind of shifting a little bit but i think you know things like this and the education piece i mean i, I think it's huge and it's a huge opportunity in the marketplace Awesome. So we, we've talked about the future kind of high level. We're going to kind of flip the script a little bit and get into the nitty gritty. Uh, and, and Bill talked a little bit about uh, clean financials, uh, both for the entrepreneur checklist as they put their campaign together and for the investors as far as vetting potential investments. Uh, so, Gadiel, let's get into a little bit. You know, this is kind of our bread and butter here on the accounting and financial side, but Let's get into why not just crowdfunding companies, but, you know, early stage companies in general, like what are the important things you got to hit as far as getting your financials in order? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think as much as you're telling a story about the company and the product, it's just as important to craft that story around the financial aspects of the business. And, and you know, Bill touched on it uh, previously where, you know, really having that path to revenue, really understanding what your market is, really understanding if you are going to, you know, raise half a million dollars on a crowdfunding funding platform, what is that going to look like? And, and that's where we spend a lot of our time uh, on consulting companies, kind of on preparing those accurate financial projections. And, and I find this, um, this comment a little bit funny because accurate financial projections, knowing that you're building out a three to five year financial uh, projection and in two to three years, your your projections can be completely shot depending on how the business is going, whether it's growing and scaling or not. But the important part is for, for the investors, it doesn't matter who the investor is, they want to know that you've put the time and effort into thinking through your business and what it's going to take and, and what you're going to look like potentially if things work out um, in the next three to five years. So that's a huge piece of, of crafting that story. Um, understanding, you know, kind of on the, in the next piece of, of what costs you have within the business, the fixed, uh, fixed cost, the variable cost, all these are really important to understand and putting a budget in place are really important to understand for your business. And, you know, it, it's not only the, the blocking and tackling and getting these things in order, but, you know, from the investor side, it's knowing that you're putting in as much effort on the financials and in crafting that story that really starts to resonate with them and knowing that you've, that you've put those pieces in place. Um, tax implications are, are really interesting here. And, and obviously, you know, talking to a, a professional tax provider is really important. I think crowdfunding is a little bit unique depending on, um, you know, whether you're shipping a product right out of the gate. Um, obviously, as you start generating revenue, all those types of things are, are, are things that you need to just keep top of mind and, and talk to somebody to consult and kind of walk you through. Each company is very different. I think that, you know, as we've kind of highlighted here, uh, so many variables and, and different industries that can be on these platforms. So it's just important to, to really do a little bit of digging and, and really understand your own business from that side, because you don't want to be get, get, get caught. We, we've had a number of clients on our end where, you know, whether it's one investor or a crowdfunding platform, they're ready to get that investment. But then you find out that, you know, it's it's as simple as not taking care of your corporate tax uh, tax returns that can really slow that deal down or, or prevent you from getting funded. Um, you know, understanding what a, a cap table is, the capitalization table, which is really who are the investors that the company has in place within within that organization in that business. And I think, you know, the different platforms have different ways on how to handle your capitalization table and how, you know, whether you're structuring a, a special purpose vehicle for, you know, the numerous investors you'll have in place and, and getting them assigned to that and really understanding that. But, you know, something like that, you can, you know, there's many systems out there that can help you through that process. But I think it's always an important question to ask the platform and, and understand how, you know, how their recommendation goes. And I think that's, that's something that, you know, Bill, for instance, probably has quite a bit of experience in on that side. Uh, kicking it over to the next slide, Jason. Um, you know, in terms of how much you need to raise, this starts getting flushed out of, you know, as you think through your financials. And I think this is something that, 
every company really starts to think about what am I going to do with this money? Am I going to hire employees? Am I manufacturing a product and I need, you know, to really um, throw money at, at building this thing? A lot of the companies on, you know, on Indiegogo, for instance, or on this platform, you know, have something that they're, whether it's a widget or something else, it's really understanding the different components of, of your pricing structure and what that's going to look like. And obviously, a lot of that gets flushed out in your um, in your financial model. Um, but, you know, talking about the different milestones you plan on hitting with this, you know, with this investment, um, knowing how long this money is going to really take you, you know, typical, and you know, fundraise, you want to get to that 18 month runway to really give you a good year and a half of, of, you know, sustaining the business to keep it continuing to grow. Um, and, you know, mentioning the, the, the cash burn and, and, you know, um, just understanding what that budget is and what you're working towards. Uh, when you raise this, this money, I mean, the first thing you do is not go out and buy yourself a bunch of t-shirts and throw yourself a big, you know, $200,000 party. I and mean, that's not what this money is for. It's really to build your business and grow your business. And so that's something that you need to keep top of mind and, and is really important. And give yourself time, you know, plenty of time. I think there's a lot of great resources out there on, on you know, knowing when you should be fundraising and knowing that the process is not super easy. It really is a full-time job. And I think, you know, platforms like Indiegogo help you and coach you and are a resource for you. So it's really a good alter alternative and, and, and it's really important to take advantage of those resources because, you know, from the company perspective, you know, that's where a lot of companies struggle. And I think this is also a venue for really opening up the options for companies that don't necessarily have that direct access to capital or those investors. And so I think that's why, you know, crowdfunding can be really impactful moving forward from that standpoint. Um, so I want to keep these sh slides short. I mean, I want to leave enough enough time for for uh, Q and A part of part of this webinar. So I think that's it for my section, right, Jason? Yeah, let's just jump right into uh, the, the questions here. Uh, one quick note: uh, we've got a lot of questions that have already come in, but uh, we have the questions panel in your GoToWebinar console. Uh, if you've got a question uh, that hasn't been addressed, you can drop it in there. We're going to get through as many as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. But if we can't get to your question, uh, we've got contact information right there on the screen. So uh, all three of our presenters right there graciously provided their contact info. So if you've got something that you need follow up on, uh, you can reach out to them after, uh, after the webinar here. And as a quick reminder, uh, this will be recorded and will be sent out to all registrants uh, within 48 hours of this wrapping up. So, gentlemen, uh, we'll, we'll kind of jump right in. Like I mentioned, we've got uh, several questions already in the hopper here. Uh, and Michael, I'll start with you. The, we've got a few questions around this, but uh, fees. Uh, so, let's just, you know, obviously, the context of Indiegogo. Um, what are the fees associated with, you know, a successful crowdfunding launch? And is that paid out by uh, the, the company raising, or is that an additional fee paid on by the investor? Sure. Good old fees question. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep it very high level. Happy to follow up with anyone specifically. But the way our platform for Democracy VC works, um, essentially, there there are some what we call upfront costs. Um, just for sake of understanding, we'll just call them upfront. But those are things like the financial review that Bill mentioned. There's a legal review required. There's a form that needs to be filed with the SEC called a Form C. Um, an escrow account needs to be open. All, all that stuff is required, right? All of that stuff, at least for us, is done via third parties. Um, and we just pass those costs on to the the company, the entrepreneur or the issuer, if you will. So though you are responsible for those costs if you're raising money. We've gotten it down as low as we can go. So it's, it's a few thousand dollars, uh, give or take. But it, again, depends on the company. After that, during the actual raise itself, there's two components. Again, I don't want to get go into tons of detail, but very quickly, we take a 7% commission based on what we raise you, and 2% equity also based on what we raise you. So to use a very, very simple example, if we end up raising $100,000, $7,000 comes to First Democracy VC in commission payment, and 2% of the $100,000, $2,000 
typically comes in the form of warrants that we can purchase under company. So we do get a tiny, tiny stake of equity um, as well. Um, but again, both of those fees are based on how much we raise you. So we're all aligned and all incentivized to raise everyone as much as possible. Um, but that's how our fee structure works. Okay, thank you. Bill, a question for you. Uh, have you seen anybody or is it feasible to combine a Reg CF campaign with traditional venture capital? Yes, we have. So one of the, just from a compliance perspective and, and, and from a regulatory perspective, the raise itself is, can only be done on the platform for, uh, let's just say the million dollars that you raise. But what we've seen are companies that well that that may already be raising um, with VCs or with angel investors carve out a slice of the round for the crowd and on very similar terms. So we try to get as as um, as close as possible. So one example is a company called Play Impossible that we raised for. They um, they were getting a while we were getting ready to launch them, they got a, um, a VC invested in them and they did equity. And we were already in the process of doing a convertible note with them, but it was on almost identical terms. Like if the money converted, it would be pretty much similar terms. And so um, and, the, and the VC was comfortable with us participating as well. So it was a win win for everybody. I think that's great news. Uh, Gaddy, I have a question for you. Actually, a, a couple of different questions around this topic, but uh, I'll kind of distill into one. But uh, if if a company is needing an audit, are there audit firms that work specifically with early stage companies? So yeah, so th th this is a, a question we've been getting quite a bit uh, recently with companies engaging on on these types of platforms, um, and there are firms out there that are both, you know, really focusing on, on the crowdfunding, the review of the financials, and then also doing uh, some of this audit work. Um, it is a little bit new out there. I think one of the, one of the considerations really ends up being the price of, of the review and the price of the audit. Um, and so I, I'm actually um, thrilled to hear that some of these folks are, are popping up and are, are pretty cost effective solutions. And I'm sure the uh, the uh, you know Bill and, and Michael both have recommendations on folks that that have worked on those reviews and and such on that side. So, in terms of preparing the financials, that's going to either be the company or you know a firm like us or somebody else that will handle that piece of it. And then you'll get an independent auditor or an independent uh, firm to review those financials in, in order to make sure you're compliant there. All right. Um, Michael and Bill, I'll throw this out to both of you. Uh, and we've got a couple of questions kind of around this, but is there a typical range for, for valuations uh, that you guys have seen so far? Or feel free to say it's all over the place, but is there some sort of range that you guys are seeing? I'm going to, I'm going to default to it's all over the place, but I'll, I'll add in I'll add to it. So it really does depend on the company and where they're at. It, you know, we're look, we've looked at companies that were a valuation of $2 million and we've looked at companies. Um, I'm trying to think if they're on our site or if we're still in review, but there's some that are 50 million plus. And um, I would say the average raise right now that we're seeing is somewhere in the five to 10 million. And that's just based on, traction but this is really for anyone so it, it it just depends on your 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 company situation all right um with lots of questions around specific industries uh can i do this for for my business can i do this for this industry michael have you seen any let's just start with industries have you seen any industries that aren't a good fit for kind of the equity crowdfunding model like you know that you've seen kind of fall flat time and again or uh it may not make sense you know logically it, you know any kind of advice from that side 
Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, again, I think we're too early to even know. We're still learning. I mean, I can only speak to our platform and a little bit about some of the other platforms, but you know, I'll kind of take it the other way. I think where we're seeing a lot of traction, it, it really is open to anything. Like we're willing to review anything and things always surprise us, right? I mean, I don't think Bill and I, either of us came into this thinking that, you know, film, for example, would be a popular, you know, we've only done one film, but we have a lot more we're talking to and I'm pretty bullish on it. So things always surprise us, but, you know, I, I think the ones that are, are definitely seem to be a lot of interest in, um, our film, also small business. And when I say small business, that includes like the breweries, distilleries, the restaurants, the mom and pop type businesses that Gadiel pointed out. He's exactly right. Like those just aren't a fit for VC money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, trust me, you don't always want VC money. Like that's a good thing to keep in mind. Like VCs are great, but it's not for everyone. Um, so small business film, you know, I think the gaming industry is really, really interesting like video games. We've actually done a video game. We even did a board game company, you know, that's done like, you know, 30, I think 30 or so board games. It's just it really the key is, and again, we're still learning it's not all the answers, but is a good business like Bill and Gadiel pointed out, you know, financials and details and plan, all that stuff is very important, but the community is also really important. And, you know, again, Indiegogo, has been doing this crowdfunding thing for almost a decade now. And it really does come down to your community. You know, we can help promote it and everything, but if, if you can't get your passionate supporters, friends, family, customers, neighbors to invest, you know, a hundred dollars in your company, it's going to be really hard to get strangers to invest in your company. So, you know, I would just, I'd say it's completely wide open. We haven't seen anything in particular that I can think of that's a necessarily a bad fit, but we've more been surprised on that, you know, lots of different industries have found a way to make this work which is awesome uh bill a real interesting question uh and, and michael maybe we can throw it to you as well if you've got insight but uh like pre, the pre-revenue tech company right um that you know they can go out and potentially get uh traditional vc funding you know if they've got if the pieces are in place and they've got whether it's LOIs or maybe, you know, a few pilot customers or wh whatever it might be, um, you know, for those kind of pre-revenue companies, particularly in the tech world, and Bill, I'll start with you. Is that any kind of fit for kind of this kind of platform or should they get to some sort of proof of concept or, you know, uh, you know, paying customers first? Like what, what do you think would work there? Where's, where, where's the target? It all, it, it does vary from company to company. Um, and I know that that's going to be a common theme and it's, it, it's tough because it's, it, it really depends on the type of company, the team and, and really what, what the traction points are for that. So if it's just as an example, if it's, if it's a company where um, you've got the founding team that has three exits between them, and they're coming from well-known companies, an idea might even be enough to raise money. Um, if you have a company where it's new first-time founders, um, that, that same idea probably wouldn't get funded as, as well. Um, so you might need to have a little bit of traction. So you're gonna have to need to have like a prototype or you're gonna have to have a working product and you're going to have to have a little bit of traction and show that there that there's a propensity for people to like it or to sign up for your newsletter or to you know download your app or w whatever it is and engage with you um, and then but it, you don't have to have revenue that's 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 just one all those things make it easier to raise but there's so many variables that you just need to have a few of them to fall into place for it to uh, make sense. Uh, I'll just add one quick example. We mentioned it before, but if you go look at our the deals we've done, Play Impossible is a good example. That's the one that Bill mentioned that did have a, a VC investor involved and, and other investors involved. You know, a lot of the, that was one of the first deals we did. Um, but the reason we did it and they were interested, vice versa, the founder had a previous exit. You know, very very experienced team. Um, the product they had a partnership in place that really helped for their particular type of company, which is sort of a hardware software combined play. 
Um, and again, the VC, you know, sort of proof, uh, proof point that other quote unquote, you know, full-time professional investors were interested in this company. You know, all of those are sort of check boxes, right? So they were pre revenue um, but we, we, we did move ahead because they didn't met. So if we look at every deal holistically and there's just, there's no right answer. <laughs> Growing revenue month over month is never a bad thing, but you know, we, we look at everything. So have you guys seen, um, you know, this, again, kind of distilling a few different questions here, uh, particularly the valuation question. Uh, are you guys in on those conversations? Like, are you, do you know what kind of valuations these companies are getting and, and where they're going? Like, is it just a standard business valuation? Like, uh, Bill, I'll throw it back to you first again. Like, do you, do you get, have any visibility on that? Like, what they're, what they're doing, what the process is to get the valuation in place? Yes. Yeah. So we are involved in those conversations. We, we will approve or decline uh, a company from our site just based on valuation. If, even if we like the company, if it's too high or it doesn't make sense, we'll pass on it. Um, I think that, you know, we're, what we're trying to do with our portal is, yes, we want it to be um, open to everyone, but we do want to have some layers of filter in it. And so what we try to do is, you know, we try to give guidance. We try to say, you know, we don't want, no one wants to waste their time, right? We don't want a company to pay the upfront money and then have us do all this marketing to have a, a failure. And so we know what our investors are looking for and we know what we think is, is high or, or a fair valuation. So we, give guidance we will um show examples of other companies that have been successful luckily we have like i said we've raised money for over 200 companies so we can always point back and say okay well, how does this company with this traction and revenue fit compared to these other ones that are similar i'm not doing the same thing but like in a similar life part of their life cycle and so um that that's really what we're doing there but a lot of times the companies have raised money or have done something else outside of raising with us. And so we have at least a starting point to go off of. But if there isn't a starting point, then we'll even make a suggestion if, if necessary. But at the end of the day, it's the company. They have it. it it's up to them what they want to do. And then in terms of the valuation piece, just to jump in, um, we're talking about, you know, what have, what the company is coming in at as kind of their, their business valuation. And those are very different from kind of the 409A valuation where you're actually putting in place and, and getting a formal valuation done for the, for essentially the stock options that you're granting to employees and, and folks like that. I mean, at this stage, these companies are raising they're more focused on kind of the business side of the valuation. They're not doing kind of formal 409As, right? Yes, you're, you're exactly right. Yes, it is. Um, 409A is going to typically be a lot lower than the valuations that um, these companies would, um, would um, get. And, you know, and it used to be, if you come up with a tech idea in the Valley, and you've got a decent solid team, you can raise money at a 5 million valuation on, on, on your first, or a 5 million cap on your convertible note. There's no way that a 409A valuation would come anywhere near that, right? Um, but, you know, sometimes all it takes is an idea in the team to get it, to kind of kick it off. And then other parts of the country could be 2 million or 3 million. It just depends, um, you know, what the market bears. But yeah, that's, that they're, they're separate. Nice. Uh, great. I, we're kind of bumped up right here on the hours. So I think that's a good uh, stopping place there. We had a bunch of questions, great questions from the audience. Please, again, contact information is right there on the screen. If you have any questions, uh, you can uh, reach out to these, these gentlemen directly. You can also submit questions through the GoToWebinar platform after the fact. It'll come to us via an email. We're happy to help out when and where we can. Uh, so, gentlemen, Michael, Bill, Gadiel, thank you for joining us and, and sharing your insight. This was fantastic. Um, again, this will be a recording made available to everyone. So, if you need to go back and refer at any point. Uh, so, with that, I'll wrap it up there. 
Uh, thanks to everyone that attended. Again, thanks to our panelists for participating today and have a great rest of your day.